Good afternoon. Good afternoon both to the people here in the McKinsey building. Actually, people coming together is something of a novelty. And good afternoon to everybody who is present on Zoom. Um, here this afternoon, we have one of the series of Better the Devil You Know seminars that are being provided by the Arne Manderson Stable. The reason I'm here, there's no very good reason for me being here. I happen to be the director of the Arne Manderson Stable. And um, so I was keen to come along and show some support to our about to be uh, new members. And um, also to express um, my thanks for the support that both you here in the room and on Zoom are giving to the work of the stable. Um, of course, one of the great advantages of video conferencing is that so many people, possibly from all over Scotland, are now able to get the benefit of these talks. And I think that is an example of how the pandemic has um, proved the technology was there, but this now is what we can do. For those in the room, you are at a disadvantage to those on Zoom, at least to those on Zoom who uh, registered their address. They should be sitting with um, tonic and I'm told an alcoholic mixer. So some of them perhaps are enjoying that at the moment. Everybody here, mind you, is looking very dry. <laughs> so <clears throat> thank you very much for coming. Arnott Manderson is a full service stable, by which we mean we have the full range of um, legal areas that are covered, at least generally covered, in the courts in Scotland. And our very first speaker, who will be introduced by our own Nicola Gilchrist, a highly experienced, highly experienced family practitioner. Our very first speaker, Megan Davidson, is an example of family services that we are offering and will be offering. And then in Sarah Loosemore and Thomas Malhall, maybe more of the general uh, reparation areas. We also have tax specialists, we have criminal practitioners, we have corporate uh, practitioners. So we do believe that we can give a wide uh, selection of legal services. We're also very keen to hear from our users, solicitors, as to what helps them. That interface is perhaps not as well developed between the two sides of the profession as it might be, but we really do value feedback, positive and negative. We really do value feedback. It should also be borne in mind that this kind of seminar is available to anybody who wants it in their own offices or their own areas. Contact our clerks. Our principal managing clerk, Andrew Sutherland, will be very happy to talk about who might be appropriate to give talks in any particular area and to facilitate uh, that happening. So um, with all of that, thank you very much. I'm going to ask Nicola, please, to come and introduce Megan Davidson, who was her devil. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am happy and indeed delighted to introduce our first speaker uh, this afternoon, my devil, uh, Megan Davidson. Megan and I go way back, um, and she and I have dealt with hard family law cases from the Sheriff Court to the Supreme Court. Um, I am delighted that she joins our stable um, next week. And I know we shall see very great things from her. So um, yes, Megan, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming along. Um, I'd firstly like to thank Jonathan and Nicola for the introduction. And I hope that in half an hour's time, you're not sitting wondering if I'm the same Megan that Nicola was just referring to. I'm going to start off this afternoon by just giving a brief overview about what I'm going to be covering. Um, firstly, I will look at the offence created by Section 1 of the 2018 Act. I will give an overview of what that offence is. And then I will consider the requirement for corroboration and what the Crown requires to corroborate in order to prove a Section 1 offence. I will then go on to consider non-harassment orders in the criminal domestic context, and I will look at the test and procedure which is applied in domestic cases. <clears throat> 
I will also discuss the court's ability to include conditions in relation to a child on the complainer's order. And finally, I will then turn to look at the importance of obtaining the child's views and how the approach to that issue differs quite considerably between the criminal and civil courts. So firstly, if we have a look at the Section 1 offence under the 2018 Act, that offence is committed where the accused A engages in a course of behaviour, which is abusive of the partner or ex-partner B, and that the following two conditions are met that a reasonable person would consider the behavior likely to cause B to suffer physical or psychological harm, and A either intends to cause that harm or is reckless as to whether the behavior causes such harm to B. I've provided some more detailed slides which will be available to you in due course, which I'm going to skip through just now in the interests of time. The main points to bear in mind for the purposes of this afternoon are that a course of behaviour require, requires behaviour on at least two separate occasions, and also that the relationship between the parties is presumed under Section 7 of the 2018 Act. So if you wish to challenge this, you either need to raise a preliminary objection prior to tendering a plea in a summary case, or alternatively, you must lodge a notice of preliminary objection in a solemn case. It's also important to be aware of sections five and eight of the Act. Section five provides for an aggravation to be libeled on a section one charge. If A, the accused, directs behavior at a child or makes use of a child in directing behavior at B, the complainer, a child sees or hears or is present during the behavior, or a reasonable person considers that the behavior is likely to adversely affect a child, usually residing with A or B or both of them together. Section eight, on the other hand, provides for alternative verdicts under sections 38 or 39 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. This would arise in situations where the court or jury wasn't satisfied that a section one offense had been committed but that there was sufficient evidence to convict on, of an offence under one of those provisions. That might be seen in a situation where the objective test in section one for a section one 2018 act offence is alleged, hasn't been satisfied, but the subjective test in section 39 was. So perhaps the complainer gave evidence of actually being in fear or alarm as a result of the accused conduct but such conduct wouldn't objectively be viewed as being likely to cause B such harm. On the other hand, where the jury aren't satisfied that there's been a course of behaviour, but they are set satisfied that the evidence led amounts to threatening or abusive behaviour, they might instead convict of a Section 38 charge. As I say, this is a pretty brief overview at this stage, and there will be further um, slides provided to you detailing some more of the information that's in the provisions of the 2018 Act. So if we move on now to consider what is required to prove a Section 1 offence. A Section 1 offence is always going to involve a charge which libels several incidents. That's the very nature of the offence being a course of behaviour. As I've said, there must be behavior on at least two occasions. However, in reality, you're often likely to come across charges with far more than two incidents being alleged. So this raises the question of what evidence is required in order to prove each element of the charge. The Sheriff Court considered this point in the case of Procurator Fiscal Livingston against H, and I've noticed that the citation is missing from the slide, so I apologize for that. The citation for anyone who wishes to note it is 2021 SLT Sheriff Court 415. In that case, the Sheriff highlighted that in a section one offense, the course of behavior is the crime that the crime requires to prove. On that basis, if the course of behavior itself is corroborated, in other words, there is corroborated evidence of at least two incidents, the Crown do not require to prove every other element of the charge by way of corroborated evidence. In the passage here, 
and I'll apologize because I can see there's a, a band showing at the bottom of the screen, which I'm not sure how to hide. So when you get this, the slide sent out to you, you should be able to hopefully read the, read the whole screen. Thank you. Sarah will be fine. Um, in the passage here, you can see that the court makes reference to previous decisions by the appeal court, where there's been a distinction highlighted between, firstly, charges which libel a number of incidents which are separate criminal acts, and secondly, charges which libel separate incidents, but nevertheless, those incidents amount to a single crime. In the first of those situations, corroboration is required for every element of the charge, and in the second situation, corroboration of every incident is not required. It is a matter of fact and degree in each case to determine which of the situations applies. The sheriff went on to state, and this is shown at the second paragraph of the slide, to my mind, it follows from this that a lower charge under section one will always include an allegation that a number of incidents took place a charge under section one really has to be seen as a charge that the accused committed a single crime, namely the crime of engaging in a course of abusive behavior. Without a course of behavior, there is no crime. And on that basis, the sheriff determined that what is required is corroboration of two or more instances of behavior, whether or not the behavior looked at in isolation would amount to a crime. So you might be thinking at this stage, well, what's the problem? It's already possible to do this with other charges and they can be treated as a course of conduct. So corroboration of each individual element isn't required. But as can be seen from the 2018 Act, section one offences can cover a very wide range of behavior. A single charge might libel incidents which in isolation would not amount to criminal behavior. But the Act also specifically allows for incidents of physical and sexual violence to be libeled. In other words, incidents which would amount to a separate crime also can form part of the course of behaviour. So can the crime prove extremely serious incidents libeled, such as serious assaults and rape, by corroborating two of the less serious incidents, which if viewed in isolation, might not even be criminal? And are there any safeguards to limit the scope of what all can be covered in one course of behaviour? In order to look at this, I think it's helpful to have a look back at some of the previous decisions of the court in cases involving a course of conduct or omnibus charges as they are often called. Firstly, Spinks against Harrower. This case involved allegations of a series of assaults over several years. Some of the incidents were not individually corroborated and some were. The appellant was convicted of all of the incidents libels and appealed to the Sheriff Appeal Court and thereafter the High Court. The Crown argued in the appeal that the assaults all formed part of a single course of conduct and accordingly, each separate incident did not require corroboration. The High Court granted the appellant's appeal, quashing the conviction in relation to the uncorroborated incidents and stated, the court is unable to sustain the crime submission, which amounts to a substantial change in the law of evidence. A person cannot be convicted of a crime on the evidence of one witness alone. There requires to be corroboration. The case of Finlay against Her Majesty's Advocate also considered an omnibus charge, albeit in the context of an offence under Section 38 in this case. The libel covered behaviour over a number of incidents on various occasions. The specific dates of each incident not being specified in the charge. In Finlay, the court did ultimately hold that the matter of whether the libel amounted to a single course of conduct or whether it was a series of separate incidents was to be left to the jury. However, the court emphasized that where a number of separate criminal acts are libeled within the same charge, each will require to be corroborated in the normal way. Going on then to say, one cannot avoid the need for each such act to be individually corroborated simply by asserting that they were all part of a single course of conduct. 
This links back with the Sheriff's reference in the Procurator Fiscal Livingston against H case to the appeal court previously having set out that it was a matter of fact and degree in each case whether the conduct can be said to be a single course of conduct or not. If we turn now to consider cases where the Murov Doctrine applies, these are cases where separate incidents of behaviour might not be individually and separately corroborated, but where evidence of similar conduct can be used to mutually corroborate these incidents. Whilst it might be said that over time the Murov Doctrine has been adapted, there are certain key requirements and considerations which exist when determining whether the doctrine can apply. Firstly, if we look at the case of Rizmanovsky against Her Majesty's Advocate, the accused in this case was charged with sexual assault on a young child. The charge was an omnibus one which libeled three distinct but similar episodes occurring on different occasions over a period of time. Only the last of the incidents was corroborated and the witness was the child's mother. The jury had been directed at trial that the evidence of the mother could corroborate the complainer's evidence on all three episodes, but was not directed in relation to mutual corroboration. The appellant appealed against this conviction and the appeal was allowed insofar as it deleted the reference to the word repeatedly in the charge, thus leaving the one incident which had been corroborated by the mother. This was on the basis of the failure to give the direction about mutual corroboration. The court highlighted that whilst the Crown had considerable latitude when framing such charges, that this had no bearing on the need to corroborate each separate criminal act. The court then went on to set out that in order for the jury to have convicted of the whole charge being the three separate incidents, they would have to hold that each episode was a component part in a single course of conduct persistently pursued by the appellant. That in turn required the jury to examine the similarities and dissimilarities in time, place and circumstances. The case of Her Majesty's Advocate against Taylor also concerned a single charge covering several, several incidents of offending behaviour, but this time under Section 5 of the 2009 Act. There were four incidents and again only the final incident was corroborated. The appellant was convicted and appealed to the Sheriff Appeal Court, which was successful. Then the Crown appealed to the High Court and the appeal was allowed. On appeal, the court confirmed that each individual incident required corroboration and that Murov was available where there was only one complainer, but for one of the incidents, there was a witness by another party. There was no need for multiple complainers in order for the doctrine to apply. Again, the court emphasized that the principle remains the same regarding the requirement for similarity in time, place, and character. That is essentially the, scro the scope or restriction placed on the application of Murov that there be certain similarities and that the jury are directed to look at the similarities and dissimilarities. Moving on from that, a further restriction on a course of conduct or the ability to mutually corroborate different incidents has been highlighted by the courts in relation to cases where there are both sexual and non-sexual incidents libeled. In the case of Duthie, the court stated that However interesting it may be to analyze the place of rape as a crime of violence in the domestic context, the law has traditionally distinguished between two types of behavior, sexual and non-sexual. Adding that, although the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 reflects important advances in society's understanding of the nature and effects of sexual abuse, it does not alter the position that rape is different from a physical assault given the need for penetration. Again, that case was not in the context of a section one offence, but where does, does that leave us in terms of there being any safeguards which can or will be imposed on the scope of a course of behaviour in a section one case? Will these same safeguards or restrictions be applied in section one cases where there is a wide range of behaviour libeled? Will individual criminal acts require to be corroborated separately from a series of otherwise non-criminal acts? At present, it would appear not. I'm aware of at least one outstanding section one case where the libel alleges a wide range of behavior. In this case in particular, the allegations go from restricting the complainer's choice of clothing and makeup through to there being allegations of several incidents of rape. 
Counsel in that case took a plea in bar of trial on the basis of oppression and that the Crown was libeling rapes that they could not prove. Counsel's argument was that either the Crown were seeking to moor off the rapes with non-sexual violent crimes alleged by a separate complainer, or alternatively, they were seeking to prove the rape as part of the Section 1 offence by the fact that there was corroboration of at least two other incidents where the accused was verbally abusive to the complainer. The Crown confirmed that the intention was not to rely on the other complainer and that the intention of the Crown was not to seek to prove the crime of rape, but rather to prove a particularly serious incident of abusive behaviour under Section 1. If two other incidents of abusive behaviour were corroborated, the incidents of rape did not require any separate corroboration. The plea and bar of trial was repelled. The court stated that if it were the case that incidents of behaviour in a section one case required to fall away if they were uncorroborated, where at least two other incidents were corroborated, the 2018 Act would be merely cosmetic. The court also added that it did not anticipate that the full extent of the requirements for Murov, such as those which I've just discussed, would be applicable to determine whether incidents could be said to amount to a single course of behaviour. It was to be left to the jury to determine whether the incidents were a course of behaviour or whether they were truly separate incidents. That case has not yet gone to trial, but I suspect it might be one to look out for in due course, depending on the outcome. All that can be said at present is that it would appear that the answer to the question of what restrictions or safeguards will be placed on what can be covered by one course of behaviour is very little. I'll move on now to consider the imposition of non-harassment orders in a criminal domestic context. The procedure for this can be found under section 234AZA of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. This section of the Act applies where the offence in question is a Section 1 DASA offence, such as the offences we've just discussed, or where the offence has a domestic aggravation under Section 1 1A of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016. I would pause here again to highlight the importance of challenging the aggravation at the outset if you do have a case where your client's position is that the offence does not involve the abuse of a partner or ex-partner, as otherwise this section will apply when it comes to the stage of disposing of the case and sentencing. The section provides that the court must consider the imposition of a non-harassment order of its own accord. It is not a matter which is left to the prosecutor to raise. The court must impose an order unless it reaches a negative conclusion. The negative conclusion being that there is no need for the victim or any children, which I'll turn to in due course, to be protected. If the court does not impose a non-harassment order, it must state the reasons as to why. The test and procedure was considered in the case of Finlay against Corins, where the sentencing sheriff had imposed a non-harassment order despite the complainant in question not being supportive of such an order. The court on appeal expressed that the legislation could be considered to be clumsy in terms of its wording and sought to clarify the test, stating, the court must make a non-harassment order unless it concludes that there is no need for the victim to be protected by such an order. In other words, the court must make an order unless it is positively able to conclude that there is no need for the victim to be protected by such an order. The court then went on to consider the issue of the complainer's views, highlighting that the provision makes no reference to the views of the victim, but that in some cases it may be necessary to consider the victim's views when assessing necessity. If parties wish for the views to be considered, then they must ensure that they furnish the court with that information in order for it to be taken into account. And this is something to bear in mind when dealing with such cases, as if there are emails or letters or the like from the complainer regarding the imposition of either special bail conditions or a non-harassment order itself, it would be prudent to provide this correspondence to the court in order for it to be considered if your client wishes to oppose the making of a non-harassment order at that stage. As I mentioned, in certain circumstances, the court can consider including a child on the order. 
essentially imposing as a condition of that order a prohibition on contact or the like between the child and the convicted person. In these circumstances, a child is defined as a person under the age of 18. The child can be included where the child usually resides with the complainer or the convicted person or both, or where the offence is a section one offence with a section five aggravation. The court should consider inclusion of the child if satisfied that it is appropriate to do so. In the case of W against Her Majesty's advocate, the court required to consider what the correct test was that should be applied when considering whether to include a condition in relation to a child on a non-harassment order for the adult complainer. The court set out the two-stage test that should be applied in such cases. Firstly, the court must consider whether inclusion is appropriate. And secondly, the court must then impose the order unless it reaches the negative conclusion. And so far as the appropriateness part of the test is required, the court in that appeal stated that this was nothing more than a threshold. This leads us on to consider the importance of the views of the child in court cases. The issue was raised on appeal in the W case that it was not appropriate to impose the non-harassment order, including conditions for the children, as their views had not been sought by the court. The information about the children's views was conflicting and for the most part came from their mother, who was the complainant in the charges being considered. The appeal court held that the court does not require the views of those who might be protected by an order and that they viewed the obtaining of views unnecessary in any event. The outcome of this was essentially that two older children who have described as both being teenagers on the slide, but I think in fairness, they were 14 and 11 at the time, were prohibited from seeing their father for a period of three years and their views did not feature as a consideration in the making of that decision. If this is compared with the approach that is taken in family cases under section 11 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995, it's clear that the civil and criminal courts are taking an extremely different approach to the importance of considering a child's views. Section 117B sets out that when considering making an order for contact or residence, for example, the court, whilst taking into account the age and maturity of the child, shall, so far as practicable, take sorry, give the child the opportunity to indicate whether they wish to express a view. If they do, allow them to express it and then have regard to such views as have been expressed. The rule of thumb used in these cases used to be that the child was capable of expressing a view once they were age 12. However, that's now been lowered to the age of five. The ability for the court to avoid taking the child's views will become further restricted when the Children's Scotland Act 2020 comes into force. The Act removes the current test and sets out that the court must give the child the opportunity to express their views and can only avoid this requirement where the child is not capable of forming a view or their whereabouts are unknown. The importance of obtaining a child's views in such cases was considered in the case of LRK against AG. The court set out that the starting point is to consider Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. The article is set out in full in the slides, apart from the bottom bit, which you will be able to see in due course, but it's worth highlighting that it specifically makes reference to children being given an opportunity to be heard in any judicial or administrative proceedings affecting them. The court has recognized that Article 12 is not absolute and that consideration should also be given to the best interests of the child when making decisions about seeking their views. Reference was made to this in both the LRK case and also M against C. However, the court in M against C did make it explicitly clear that this did not replace the statutory test with judicial discretion. The court stated that it will rarely be correct to conclude that seeking the views of a child will cause unavoidable and material harm to the child. And that if children are of sufficient age and maturity to form and express a view, their voices must be heard unless there are weighty adverse welfare considerations of sufficient gravity to supersede the default position. <clears throat> 
Taking this passage into consideration, it could be said that if the issue of contact between the father and children in the W case had been before a civil court rather than a criminal court, the views of the children would have been required to have been taken regardless of the background of domestic abuse. Once obtained, those views would of course had to be considered alongside other factors. However, the important thing in line with the rights of the child as set out in Article 12 of the Convention would be that the children's voices had been heard. So we can see that there are two very different approaches to the issue of the importance of children's views. In one court, a great deal of emphasis is placed on at least obtaining the children's views, even where the child might be as young as five. And in the criminal court next door, the court may proceed to make an order for a lengthy period, preventing contact between a child who may be as old as 17 with their offending parent, without even making inquiry into what that child's views are in relation to the imposition of the order. It may be that ultimately a child will challenge the imposition of such an order or seek to have it buried or revoked. And there is provision for this under the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. Section 234 subsection six does provide for an application to be made to either vary or revoke such an order However, this has to be done by either the convicted person or the prosecutor. In a case where contact is prohibited between a parent and a child, the practical difficulties of the parent being able to lodge that application, essentially on behalf of the child, may be insurmountable. And it's unclear whether a prosecutor would be required to lodge such an application upon receiving a request to do so. Finally, I've added a slide highlighting some further issues which should be borne in mind when dealing with civil cases, particularly where there are issues of domestic abuse being raised. So that brings me to the end of my talk and I would like to thank you for listening and I hope that we might have time for um, a couple of questions if anybody has any questions. Megan, thank you very much. Um, I'm off screen, but perhaps you're hearing my voice. Um, <clears throat> shall we divide this first by looking at uh, qu any questions that may have come in from our digital audience? Andrew? Uh, which there are none so far. It says chat, it says chat 23. I'm hoping that's not yeah, that's 23 <laughs> questions. <laughs> no, you'll be happy to know that's just people <laughs> confirming that they could hear us. All right, okay, that's good. Uh, so, yes, I think that ought to be the trick. So perhaps I should have said, if anybody at home on Zoom does have a question, if you could use the chat function to ask the question, I'll then read it out to the audience. Um, so perhaps first we could ask if anybody in here has any questions that they would like to ask. That, that is absolutely fine. Okay, so enjoying their gin and tonic, I'm sure. Well, thank you very much for listening. Megan, thank you very much indeed. Um, our next speaker is Sarah Loosemore, who, um, in reading her CV and getting to know her, um, I think is entirely admirable, apart from in one regard. She established a very, very successful career in Canada and has decided to come to Scotland. Now, Scotland's great, but I just Come back from Canada where I've been on holiday and I thought it was even greater so I, <laughs> I, I, I feel really Sarah you're doing a great compliment to us by wanting to be here. Um, <clears throat> Sarah has a great width of experience, um, first class honours degree in maths before she turned to law, just like Lord Mackay of Clash Ferns, so you've got a good uh, forerunner there. Um, clerk to the Superior Court of Ontario, called to bar, criminal defence work, attorney general's office work, complex prosecutions, and then um, has spent some time in the healthcare team and historical child abuse um, cases team of um, Clyde & Co. Um, the topic that Sarah is speaking on today is expert evidence. Um, I was reminding myself as I looked at a very chunky book on my shelf at home, how the English have so much more law on and think so much more about expert evidence as a topic than we do 
And I think often we don't actually think through what it is that expert evidence is doing for a court. Uh, more traditionally in Scotland, it's skilled evidence as opposed to expert evidence. And that was to highlight the fact that it was a witness bringing to the court a skill that the court did not have. A well instructed, sorry, a well constructed letter of instruction to an expert can often make the difference between uh, success in a case and not success in a case. We also perhaps have a knee jerk reaction, which is bring in the expert. Let's take, for example, cases of um, negligence against lawyers. Well, I think most solicitors in Scotland would immediately think, oh, I need an expert. Well, in England, if you were talking about uh, litigation practice and charges of negligence, it would be very rare for the court to permit um, an expert in litigation, unless it was perhaps complex tax opinion work, because the court there takes the view, I'm a judge, I'm a lawyer, I don't need to be told by another lawyer what is um, appropriate practice and what is not appropriate practice. So, uh, Sarah, I've spoken longer than I should have done, but I think this is a very important topic that is not given sufficient thought time and time again. Help us out. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Hopefully I will do the topic justice. Um, so my talk uh, addresses the judicial role with respect to admissibility of expert evidence in both civil and criminal cases. Um, what I intend to do is explore the extent to which the court does or should play a gatekeeping role in determining the admissibility of expert evidence or skilled opinion evidence as it's referred to in Scotland. And my own interest in this topic goes back to some experiences that I had when I started practicing at the criminal defense bar in Canada about uh, 20 years ago. So I was curious to see how Scotland grapples with this issue. And um, so with that in mind, oh, sorry, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing to change the slide. <laughs> Sorry to put you to the test. Ah, there we go. All right. So here's what I intend to do. Um, I'd first like to give a little bit of background on the Canadian approach to the judicial function with respect to expert evidence. And next, I will turn to the Scottish approach um, and look at the decision, the Supreme Court decision in Kennedy against Cordia from 2016 and then uh, some subsequent cases in Scotland. And then finally, I'll just give some concluding thoughts about uh, how we as legal practitioners might want to think about the issue of admissibility of expert evidence going forward. So the Canadian perspective. Um, when I started practicing in Canada in the early 2000s, the role of expert evidence, especially in uh, the criminal context, was under significant scrutiny because of a particular expert named Dr. Charles Smith. And he was a doctor who routinely gave expert evidence in the field of pediatric forensic pathology. In the 1990s, he was involved in a series of cases uh, that involved the deaths of children and his expert opinion led to the prosecution and conviction of a number of parents and caregivers in relation to those deaths. Now, what eventually became clear is that his training was inadequate. He was not approaching his task in an impartial way, and his reports were not scientifically reliable. His involvement in these cases had led to a number of serious miscarriages of justice, including one case where a wrongfully convicted man spent 12 years in prison for the murder of his niece. There were some other cases of wrongful conviction where individuals charged with murder had pled guilty to much less serious offenses to avoid taking the risk of an automatic life sentence if they were convicted at trial. Um, these cases led to a public inquiry 
led by Mr. Justice Gouge, which considered how the miscarriages of justice had been allowed to happen and what could be done to prevent something similar from happening in the future. Justice Gadge's report was released in 2008 and considered a wide range of institutional failures, both in the criminal justice system and also in the medical profession. One of the areas that he considered was the role of the court, and he devoted 44 pages to the issue of what he described as, quote, the vital gatekeeping role of the trial judge. As a result of cases like those involving Dr. Smith, the Canadian courts have progressively tightened the rules of admissibility relating to expert evidence and have significantly augmented the judicial gatekeeping function with respect to such evidence over the last 20 years. The modern Canadian test is set out in a Supreme Court case called White Burgess Langell Iman against Abbott and Halliburton which was a professional negligence action by shareholders against their former auditors. And the particular issue in that case was the impartiality and independence of a forensic accounting expert. Um, so I've put the test on the slide there. Basically the starting place in Canada is that expert evidence is inadmissible and the party seeking to tender it must justify its admission. The test for admissibility proceeds in two stages. The first stage is uh, the establishment of four or sometimes five threshold requirements. The threshold requirements are first, the logical relevance of the evidence. Second, the necessity of the evidence in the sense that it will assist the trier of fact. Third, the absence of an exclusionary rule. Fourth, a properly qualified expert. And it's under that, um, that requirement that the impartiality and independence of the expert is considered. And then finally, an additional requirement for novel or contested science that the underlying science be reliable. So if any of those threshold requirements are not established, then the evidence is inadmissible. But even if the threshold requirements are met, then the judge goes on to the second stage of the test and the second stage um, is a discretionary gatekeeping stage where the judge balances the potential risks and benefits of admitting the evidence to determine if the benefits outweigh the risks. So in Canada, in both criminal and civil proceedings, <clears throat> it's routine to have a pretrial motion where evidence would be heard and um, submissions would be made and the issue of the admissibility of the evidence would be determined. And the motions aren't necessarily done on an all or nothing basis. You might have uh, a judge who would set out specific parameters for the expert's evidence. And then if at the trial in front of a jury, the expert were to exceed those parameters, then that would be grounds for a mistrial. And I think as in Scotland, in the case of a non-jury civil or criminal trial as a practical matter, the issue might be dealt with by hearing the evidence and reserving the question of admissibility until the end of the trial, but it would still be considered within the framework of the test I've just set out. And this relatively restrictive approach um, that the Canadian courts have taken is driven by a concern about the potential dangers of expert evidence. Justice Cromwell writing for the Supreme Court in the White Burgess judgment said, the dangers are well known. One is that the trier of fact will inappropriately defer to the expert's opinion rather than carefully evaluate it. As Justice Sapinka observed in Mohan, there is a danger that expert evidence will be misused and will distort the fact finding process. Dressed up in scientific language, which the jury does not easily understand, and submitted through a witness of impressive antecedents. This evidence is apt to be accepted by the jury as being virtually infallible and as having more weight than it deserves. So that, uh, in a nutshell, is the Canadian approach, which has developed over the last couple of decades. And it's quite a rigorous test that proceeds from a starting place that the admission of the expert evidence must be justified by the party seeking to tender it. 
So let's turn now to the Scottish approach. And I just would like to take a moment to look at what the approach was before Kennedy against Cordia. And for that, I will uh, take you to a case called Haney against Her Majesty's Advocate from 2013. Now, this case, uh, similarly to those involving Dr. Smith, concerned a mother who was charged with murder in relation to the death of her infant son. The Crown's case was based on her failure to care for her son properly. So it was a relatively unusual situation where it was a crime of omission. At trial, the Crown led evidence from two forensic anthropologists, neither of whom claimed to have any medical qualifications. They gave evidence about a particular phenomenon observed in the child's bones, which they said might be indicative of neglect and malnutrition. The Crown uh, was relying on this evidence to support its ultimate case, which was death by neglect. The evidence was challenged vigorously and contradicted at trial by the defense. And at the close of the defense case, uh, a motion was made inviting the trial judge to direct the jury to disregard all the evidence relating to the bone phenomenon. That submission was rejected. In his closing speech to the jury, the advocate deputy treated that evidence as a crucial part of the Crown case and the appellant was convicted of murder and appealed. The High Court allowed the appeal and quashed the conviction on the basis that the jury should have been directed to ignore the expert evidence because there wasn't a sufficiently reliable scientific basis for it. Um, the opinion of the court was delivered by Lord Clark and I've put a, a quote up on the slide there. Um, at paragraph 49, he addressed the role of the court in relation to expert evidence in Scotland. And he said there, it is true that in our system of criminal procedure, there is no specific procedure set down for the judge to operate a gatekeeper's role, whereby during some procedure or hearing prior to trial, he can determine whether or not a person who is to be invited to give evidence at the trial has the necessary expertise and qualifications to give that evidence. That does not, in our judgment, relieve the judge from performing that function where necessary. And Lord Clark goes on to say, while the trial judge does not act as a gatekeeper, in such matters he has a continuing role as referee or umpire throughout the trial to ensure that it is conducted fairly and that evidence from a person claiming specialist knowledge and expertise, who clearly does not have such expertise and knowledge, is disregarded by the jury. So this case uh, shows clearly that the Scottish courts are live to the potential dangers of expert evidence based on unreliable science or an underqualified expert. However, there was no mechanism for addressing those concerns pre-trial as an admissibility issue. So that brings us to Kennedy against Cordia in 2016. And the significance, it seems to me, of Kennedy against Cordia is that the Supreme Court in its decision formalized a gatekeeping role for the courts in Scotland. Um, that case involved an employer's liability for an injury sustained by an employee. Uh, she was working as a personal carer and slipped on ice um, on a public pavement while she was on her way to visit a, an elderly person. And first of all, I should say that this was a civil case and therefore not binding on the High Court uh, in respect of criminal cases, but it was referenced quite quickly by the High Court in Jones and Her Majesty's Advocate. Um, so it does have application to both civil and criminal cases. The expert at issue in that case was an expert in health and safety led by the pursuer. That evidence had been accepted by the Lord Ordinary at proof. However, the inner house allowed the defender's reclaiming motion and found the evidence largely inadmissible on the basis that no expertise was required to assess the issues in question and that health and safety was not a recognized discipline. The Supreme Court reversed that decision and held that the Lord Ordinary's view had been correct. In the course of their judgment delivered on behalf of the court, Lords Reed and Hodge addressed the issue of admissibility of expert evidence in general and set out four considerations which govern its admissibility. And, and the, the court did use the language of skilled evidence in its judgment. So the four considerations are 
First, whether the proposed skilled evidence will assist the court in its task. Um, and the court did make clear that in the case of expert opinion evidence, that threshold is necessity. The second consideration is whether the witness has the necessary knowledge and experience. The third consideration is whether the witness is impartial in his or her presentation and assessment of the evidence. And finally, whether there is a reliable body of knowledge or experience to underpin the expert's evidence. Now, I read this judgment as an invitation to the courts to take on a more robust gatekeeping role with respect to expert evidence. So I was curious to see what the Scottish courts have made of that new role in the years since Kennedy against Cordia. And there are a number of subsequent cases, both on the criminal and civil side, where parties have argued that expert evidence is inadmissible based on these criteria. And I won't try and do a comprehensive review of the cases, but I'll just take you to a couple of examples. So the first one is a, a civil case, Cameron against Swan. This was a reclaiming motion against the dismissal of a personal injury claim after proof. And the defender in that case, while driving a van in the course of his employment, had run over the pursuer who was lying in the middle of the street intoxicated. The defender had already pled guilty to careless driving, but the Lord Ordinary nonetheless found the defender was not negligent. And the pursuer advanced several grounds of appeal, but for the purpose of my talk, I'll just focus on the issue that arose with respect to expert evidence. At proof, the defender had called a psychologist as an expert to give evidence about visual perception. This evidence had taken up a considerable amount of time, but there was no objection to its admissibility at the proof. Um, the Lord Ordinary relied on the expert evidence in concluding that the defender wasn't at fault for his failure to see the pursuer. On the reclaiming motion, the Lord President on behalf of the court referred to Kennedy against Cordia, uh, focusing in particular on the first consideration, which was the necessity of the evidence. And the Lord President went on to find in fairly forceful terms that the vast majority of the expert evidence was not admissible as it was far from necessary. And you'll see uh, a longer quote on the slide there where the Lord President um, basically talks about the fact that this evidence was simply not necessary. So I think this is a very clear example of the inner house exercising exactly the kind of gatekeeping role that's envisioned in Kennedy against Cordia. And it demonstrates a willingness on the part of the court to entertain these arguments, even in cases where there wasn't an objection at the time of the proof. There are also a number of other first instance decisions in a wide variety of civil cases where admissibility arguments have been made successfully. So it does uh, appear that these arguments have legs in the appropriate case. I'd like to turn now to an example from the criminal context, and I'm going to look at a pair of cases, uh, recent appeal cases from the High Court, Meehan and Williamson. They're both rape cases involving the same expert witness who is a forensic medical examiner or FME. In Meehan, the complainer had given evidence that she was violently raped by three accused. She was examined by the FME who described injuries to her abdomen, abdomen back, external and internal genitalia and anus. The FME gave opinion evidence at trial that those injuries were more likely to have resulted from non-consensual sex than consensual intercourse. That evidence was not objected to during the course of the trial and the three accused were convicted. They were unsuccessful on their initial appeals but years later, the case was referred to the High Court by the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission on the basis of fresh evidence. The fresh evidence was research that had been published subsequent to the original trial, and the research suggested that genital injuries could not be used as a basis for expressing an opinion on whether or not sexual intercourse had been consensual. So the defense argued that that evidence called into question the reliability of the FME's opinion evidence and that a miscarriage of justice had resulted 
The high court found that there was nothing new in the evidence that differed, sorry, nothing in the new evidence that differed significantly from the evidence available to the defense at the time of trial and refused the appeal. My personal view is that in doing so, the court failed to engage properly with their gatekeeping function in respect to expert evidence. Um, the court's analysis focused on the contention that the complainer's injuries supported her account of events. Uh, the opinion of the court was delivered by the Lord Justice General. Um, and I've just put a quote up on the slide there that's indicative of basically the, the reasoning of the High Court. Um, the Lord Justice General at paragraph 74 says, depending on the particular description of the incident and its coincidence with any injuries found, they're, find, they're finding, um, sorry, I'm gonna start that quote again. Depending on the particular description of the incident and its coincidence with any injuries found, their finding is corroborative of the use of force. The use of force is indicative of lack of consent, even if the injuries might also be consistent with consensual activity. Whatever the incidence of injury in consensual intercourse cases may be, it remains important for forensic medical examiners to examine those alleging rape for physical injury, especially in the genital area, in order to ascertain whether what is found by the FME is consistent with what was described by the complainer. Now, with the greatest of respect to the High Court, this approach fails, in my view, to address the particular dangers with expert evidence. The court is undoubtedly correct that the injuries were an important part of the evidence and they were capable of corroborating the complainer's account. And certainly they would have been very important evidence from the Crown's point of view. But the issue in the appeal was whether there was a sufficiently reliable underlying scientific basis for the FME to give expert opinion evidence with respect to whether the injuries were more consistent with non-consexual sexual activity. And in the absence of a proper scientific grounding for the opinion, what you're left with is the FME's own anecdotal view about what inference the jury ought to draw from the injuries with respect to the crucial issue of consent. And that anecdotal view is elevated um, to, to something uh, much more significant when it's given that stamp of expertise. There's another case following me in, uh, which was Williamson and Her Majesty's Advocate. And the issues raised on that appeal were largely the same. And the High Court decided the matter in a similar fashion. The facts in the case of Williamson, however, were much less extreme. The injury in question was one healing internal abrasion. The FME gave the opinion that the injury was more likely to be associated with non-consensual than consensual intercourse. The High Court, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, given what they had done in Meehan, um, rejected that appeal. And in my view, again, the court failed to engage sufficiently with an important distinction, which is the difference between an inference that may very well be available to a jury based on the totality of the evidence and an inference that is endorsed by an expert. So to my mind, these are disappointing results. Um, but it is always an uphill battle to be successful on appeal based on fresh evidence where there's already a conviction for rape in place. I think though that these cases do raise squarely the dangers that can arise when the court doesn't perform a gatekeeping role. Um, there's one more uh, criminal case that uh, that I'll just mention briefly. This is Her Majesty's Advocate against B. And this is an opinion from Sheriff Collins sitting as a temporary High Court judge. Um, and it's really just an example of a case where a pretrial procedure was used to determine an issue of admissibility of expert evidence. Um, in that case, the evidence was from a psychologist relating to childhood memory and delayed disclosure of child sexual abuse. The psycho psychologist had actually been instructed by the Crown in that case, but the defense sought to call that expert at trial. 
and the Crown objected to the admissibility of the evidence on the basis that the psychologist was not qualified to give expert evidence on the subject of memory. Secondly, that the evidence might be useful to the jury, but was not necessary. And thirdly, that there were certain passages in the report for which there was not an underlying reliable body of science. The Crown lodged a minute raising uh, admissibility as a preliminary issue, and there was a hearing with oral evidence and submissions. The preliminary judge sustained the minute in part and found that some aspects of the evidence were inadmissible, but, um, but the rest of it was admissible. So I just point this out as an example of, um, of uh, the judicial gatekeeping role being exercised uh, in a, as a pretrial matter in a criminal case. So finally, I'll just give a few concluding thoughts. And um, as I said, in my view, the Supreme Court in Kennedy against Cordia was inviting courts to take a more active gatekeeping role with respect to expert evidence um, and to consider it as, to consider the quality of expert evidence as an admissibility issue rather than just something that goes to the weight of the evidence. So what I take from my review of the cases post Kennedy against Cordia is that there is a developing body of case law where parties are raising the issue of the admissibility of expert evidence on the basis of the considerations set out by the Supreme Court. And I think that there's a space for further development of that gatekeeping role. The scope for, um, for that exists on an analytic level in the sense that um, the considerations set out in Kennedy against Cordia are a starting point for the judicial delineation of a new gatekeeping role for the courts. And certainly that's the experience in Canada is that that gatekeeping role has been gradually refined over the years. Um, and importantly, I think that that scope also exists now on a practical level because there are increasing pretrial case management mechanisms on both the criminal and civil side for considering admissibility issues. Um, I do want to make clear that I'm not suggesting that Scotland should embrace wholesale the Canadian approach, which frankly can be quite time consuming. Um, and that's certainly something that the Supreme Court in Kennedy against Cordia was live to. Um, on a less pragmatic note, I also think uh, there's something to be appreciated about the Scottish faith in juries to sort things out. Um, it, it's my sort of personal experience that practitioners in Ontario are quite cynical about juries. And I think if we take seriously the role of the jury, then we have to give them credit to fulfill that role. We have to believe that they're capable of properly evaluating evidence that is presented and tested through the mechanisms of the adversarial system. There is a risk that the principles of the adversarial system could be eroded by an over-reliance on judicial gatekeeping. So there certainly is a balance to be struck. Um, but what I hope you will take away from this talk is that it's worth taking a moment in any case involving an expert to consider whether their evidence meets the admissibility standards set out in Kennedy against Cordia. Going through that exercise forces us to consider the quality of the evidence and it's not a waste of time because you can always recycle your same arguments um, in your submissions about the weight that should be accorded to that evidence at the end of the day. So in conclusion, I think we have an opportunity to encourage the Scottish courts to go from being umpires to being gatekeepers. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Um, any questions in the room for Sarah? You're being allowed off. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, anything on that? Nothing to consume. Nothing to consume. Um, <clears throat> um, I have this question. Sarah. Okay. <clears throat> um, there's much more case management in the commercial. I'm talking about the civil side. Yes. There's much more case management possible and that is done in the commercial court. If you're talking about how the outer house more generally, mm -hmm. case management doesn't really feature. Mm -hmm. If you are 
a solicitor thinking about ways of excluding the other side's expert report, not least for reasons of expenses. Do you see mechanisms available to that solicitor and their counsel for some form of case management in the Ivory House that might attempt mm -hmm. to gain? I think that's a very good question, um, and I think my ignorance of civil procedure will will probably um, come through. But I, I I think it is certainly going to be much easier to address these issues in the areas where there are more formal um, case management features. But uh, I think that. If you have a good argument, I think there's there's always going to be a way to bring that forward. Um, this may not be an entirely satisfactory answer, but certainly one approach is to argue the admissibility issue rolled up with the trial. Um, and if you if you don't have a jury, I think that's uh, that's one option. And um, other than that, I think it would uh, be a matter of seeing whether you could raise it, sorry, raise it as a preliminary matter at a debate or some other kind of or perhaps enroll for a by order hearing simply yes. to argue it. Yes. yes. Um, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thomas Mulhall comes to us in the stable from um, a series of um, challenging um, reparation roles as a solicitor in private practice, casualty and occupational health team, marine and shipping, and then most recently in a um, area of practice which, well, um, distressingly given the reasons that it's coming to the courts, child abuse. And of course, we're seeing so much more of that with the removal of the limitation period. And that has then brought into sharp focus the existing law on the award of judicial interest and practice in the award of judicial interest. Many of these child abuse cases will date maybe from the late 60s or early 70s. And because of the um, current approach to awards of interest, the sum that is awarded, the principal sum, may end up being doubled and more by the effects of interest. So this is of interest to the insurers on the defender's side and of interest to the claimants on the pursuer's side. Um, arguments are in the pipeline. They haven't as yet been deployed, but Thomas will maybe give us a flavor of what that all is and may bring. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Sarah, for that uh, introduction, Jonathan. Um, Firstly, I'm going to start by uh, saying that I am acutely aware that I am the, in the post five o'clock last slot, and I am standing between everyone in this room and a lovely glass of wine. So uh, to that end, you'll note that I've popped a little caveat on the end of my title, which is I'm going to focus on damages today. The uh, subject of judicial interest is a massive area. I could talk for hours. You'll be pleased to know I won't be doing that today. So if we start with the basics, what is it? It's a percentage uplift on the award made by the court, and it's awarded in addition to the judicial, judicial award. So for today's talk, the key question is, when is it awarded from, and what percentage does the court award? Uh, in this talk, I'll start off with the general principles uh, and the pre-2008 position, um, and then move on to uh, when and how the court has been previously inclined to uh, disapply those default rules. And then finally, I'll finish with some practical considerations and some advice uh, that I think would be useful for assessing on a case by case basis, what you want to uh, do in these types of cases. So if we start with the general principles, and these are useful to have in mind throughout uh, the talk, it follows the general principles of restitution. And um, if we look at uh, all of the cases that I am going to refer to today, they all make reference to these two principles. Firstly, it's to compensate for uh, the inflationary aspect. So if we think about a long running case, say uh, the 1960s was when the original uh, wrongful act was and the damages arose. 
uh, making a modern day award in say 2022 in real terms based on the fact that inflation is a thing actually uh, reduces the overall value of the award in very real terms. The second principle to be aware of is it's to cover the uh, wronged party for the loss occasioned by not having the funds available. Now, generally speaking, the way that courts have looked at this is to view it as a loss of investment opportunity. What would you have done with the money if you had access to it? And what kind of return would you expect from uh, being able to invest the funds? Which then takes us on to the legislation and the rules. If we're looking specifically at damages, you start with the Damages Scotland Act of 1958 as amended. And section 1, 1 sets out that you can seek an award of judicial interest in a damages claim from the date that the wrongful act occurred. Um, you, as a general rule, you also have the personal injury provisions at uh, section 1, 1A, uh, which are put in a, a presumption, um, but I won't go into that in too much detail. In terms of what the judicial rate you can expect, well, that you can find that in the rules of the court session at rule 7.7, .7, and that's fixed at 8% currently. For those out there that are not mathematically inclined, uh, myself included, the rate is simple, not uh, compound interest. So you don't have to worry about overly complicated calculations. It's 8% per annum. The judicial response pre-2008, uh, you have effectively a default rule. Awards of interest uh, follow along standard lines, which is generally 8% from the date of a crystallized loss. Uh, the case of Boots the Chemist uh, is where you can find the authority for that. And if you have a loss that hasn't yet crystallized, for example, uh, ongoing loss of earnings in a personal injury case, um, then that would be at 4%. And that's the uh, Agent against the BBC case. You can also seek uh, interest at, judicial interest at 8% from the date of the decree until payment. In 2008, we will have a case that, uh, as Jonathan has alluded to, and he will be intimately familiar with, uh, the case of JM against Fife. Uh, this one was um, a precursor to uh, the cases of historic childhood abuse that we're seeing nowadays. And again, it involved um, some pretty horrific abuse of the pursuer uh, in a childhood home. In terms of um, the judicial interest position, it very much focused in on the salation aspect. Um, and it's important to keep the distinction in mind from a personal injury perspective, because salation awards are uh, updated to modern day terms. So that um, prince first principle that I was talking about in terms of the inflationary aspect, you don't need to concentrate insofar as this is concerned. And that point was made to the Lord Ordinary and he took that on board and said, well, effectively, if we say judicial interest is at 8%, well then, if we broad brush it and say half of that applies to the inflationary aspect and half of it applies to the loss of use aspect, you then have uh, the figures of 4% and 2%. So very much a broad brush approach. The 4% he applied to the period inside the home. So he awarded uh, salation for a period of some five or six years in, I believe it was 1960, it was 1961 to 1966, interest was awarded at 4% as that was treated as a crystallized loss. And then between uh, 66 to the date of decree, and 1966 to the date of decree, that was treated as an ongoing loss and therefore following the principles, that was at 2%. The next case I want to highlight is the case of uh, Farstad. Now, this is one of the few ones that I've been able to find that actually operated in the commercial sphere. And this uh, was a fire on a fishing vessel. Um, the principal sum was a matter of agreement between the parties, uh, but when it came to the Lord Ordinary at first instance, the uh, very much the focus of the submissions and the hearing was simply on the level of interest to be awarded. Um, the defender's position, which was accepted by the Lord Ordinary at first instance, was simply put, the financial crash happened. And on that basis, is it fair to award the full 8% in terms of the judicial rate? Um, 
there wasn't much in the way of expert evidence. And again, you'll see from the uh, areas that I've highlighted, uh, JM against Fife and now this, there's an absence of any detailed expert evidence. And that's a running th theme throughout these cases. The court has applied broad brush principles. Um, in this case, uh, they awarded interest at 8% between 2002 and 2008, and then post 2008, so the financial crash date, it was at 4%. The next case to highlight is that of the uh, Mr. Tommy Sheridan. I'm not going to rehearse the facts because I suspect most people in the room are very familiar with this case. Um, but of particular interest was the treatment by the Lord Ordinary at first instance of uh, his application for judicial interest. Now, um, to put it bluntly, uh, it was held by Lord Ordinary at first, first instance that Mr. Sheridan had been too naughty to uh, uh, receive interest and uh, he held the matter to be entirely discretionary and disapplied uh, judicial interest in its entirety, which was quite a significant sum. Um, the inner house uh, reversed this uh, and took the approach that this was not discretionary um, and that if it had been, they could have followed Farstad, but that realistically the court ought to be guided as a general rule by the judicial rate. So the takeaway from this case is there's a general presumption in favor of an award of interest being made and um, that there is a guidance that the court ought to follow, that it ought to be applying the judicial rate in most cases. This, the final development on this is the case of AB against the Christian Brothers. Now this was an all Scotland personal injury court uh, decision that was published in February uh, of this year. Um, you won't find Sheriff Dixon's note of reasons on interest online. Uh, special thanks to Barney Ross for passing a copy of this to me so I could include it in my talk. In essence, the, the focus of the dispute for this particular um, note from the sheriff was for a loss of earnings element. So it wasn't salation, it was specific to loss of earnings. So it was a an award that ought to have been made in 1983, which was the, the date that uh, effectively the sheriff held that the loss had been sustained. The approach of the defenders in this one was to say, well, ordinarily, and up until fairly recently, um, with the amendments to, made to the Prescription and Limitation Act, we ought not to have been liable for this. And on that basis, we would seek to restrict interest to that date. We shouldn't be uh, paying in 1983 at all, it should be from the point that we, again, effectively became liable for this. In my view, that was always going to be a difficult position to take, uh, particularly in cases <coughs> of uh, childhood abuse. The act was wrong at the time, and it was always wrong. Um, and you're going to struggle, I think, to persuade the court that they ought to um, punish a uh, pursuer for failing to bring a case uh, more quickly than they did. And that is a large part of the sheriff's reasoning. Um, and again, what's noted here and what I'd like to highlight is this idea of special circumstances, which is following on from the the Sheridan case. Um, and as noted by Jonathan in this particular action, just to give you a flavor, um, the sum awarded in respect of loss of earnings was some 300,000 and 340,000 pounds, I think it was. The interest was over 600. I'll just let that sink in for a second. Um, the court in that case awarded 4%, uh, treating it as a non-crystallized loss running from 1983 and following the general principles as set out in JM against Fife. And so, so that takes us on to practical steps. In my view, you're gonna have to take a case by case, uh, you're gonna have to take it on a case by case basis. You're gonna have to assess each one on the merits and work out whether it's going to be worth the cost of reports and investigation into it because uh, from personal experience these are expensive. In my view 
I wouldn't be looking at any cases that are uh, less than five years. I think the court is unlikely to thank you for taking up significant court time arguing on a case that isn't either of a long running or high value nature where the difference in a few percentage points for the judicial interest will make a significant difference. We now return to this idea of a special circumstance. And again, that's woven throughout all the cases that I've referred you to. In my view, the court has invited in both JM and Farstad parties to come forward with some sort of additional evidence that would allow them to disapply the general principles and the general rules. And that, in my view, is going to require expert evidence. Um, I'm, Jonathan alluded to this, and I am aware that there are several firms looking into this and who have already instructed expert reports from actuaries. The idea being that you can take a very mathematical approach to this and strip out, uh, as a general rule, what inflation would be from any given date. That's a, a possibility. And then from there, simply you have an assessment based on what your individual pursuer ought to have been able to secure in terms of an investment return. Marrying the two of those together, those two together, if you can exceed 8% significantly or come in significantly under 8%, then you have a case to make to the court that it's a special circumstance and the general rule ought to be disapplied. Uh, this is where we get on to a uh, shameless plug for my own services. You're going to need careful guidance for experts. Um, this is a fairly new area. Uh, your average uh, actuary is not going to have done one of these reports before. And um, frankly, you want to be able to present to the court in a easily digestible format um, your position. Uh, there's a lot of mathematics and a lot of numbers involved in this, and you want to be able to just pare it down to its simple, basic uh, elements. To that end, you will also need appropriate pleadings. You're going to need to have fair notice here to put the other side on notice that you are planning on taking this approach in order to be able to, to justify it to the court. I've now got two sections in terms of some thoughts for practical steps. If we start with personal injury, you're going to have to remember the different treatment between insulation and other heads. Um, again, the reasoning followed in JM is that for personal injury, it is updated to modern terms so you can strip out inflation. For uh, the AB case, uh, a significant part of the sheriff's reasoning was taken up with the fact that this, is, this was not updated and that effectively the loss of earnings was being backdated to when it was sustained um, in 1983 and uh, throughout. And therefore, in real terms, uh, he would be awarding a significantly lower sum than the pursuer potentially ought to be uh, awarded. Particularly for salation, and again, from a practical perspective, perspective, having done this previously, I can tell you that particularly for salation at least, the uh, return that you can uh, or you would expect the average pursuer to uh, achieve in an, from an investment standpoint, so again, stripping out inflation, is less than 2%. And on that basis, if you have a significant sum being awarded or being considered for salation, then it might actually be worth your while um, running one of these types of arguments. If you are the pursuer and you have one of these reports uh, coming in from the defender, and by and large, this will be defender-led as your average pursuer is probably not going to be securing an 8% investment return. Um, your starting point there is to consider the underlying assumptions of the actuary. One of the weaknesses of this approach is that there have to be underlying assumptions made by the actuary. For example, what type of investment would you have made? What sort of risk profile does the pursuer have? If you can uh, persuade the court that the, and it tends to be the average profile used is low risk um, for the pursuer. And again, that's a fairly standard across personal injury. If you can persuade the court that that's an incorrect assumption and therefore the actuary's approach is just fundamentally wrong, well then I think you're onto a bit of a winner in terms of defending that. Moving on to commercial, uh, 
I think this is one of the more interesting areas in some ways. Personal injury, um, as Jonathan has noted, this is a very developing area. It seems to me that uh, in, insofar as commercial is concerned, this is how, or this has to date been somewhat overlooked, um, particularly based on an individual pursuer. I would say it's not controversial to say that in the commercial sphere, you can probably get better investment returns than your average individual pursuer. And on that basis, I think it would be very interesting uh, once the inflationary effects are uh, stripped out, and those tend to be around about 2.7 as an average uh, using the Bank of England's website. Um, again, that's not necessarily um, the mathematical approach, and you'd want to be guided by your actuary on that. But as a general rule, if we say 2.7, and if your individual pursuer can get a return or can demonstrate to the court that they had a return in excess of six or 7%, then suddenly you're looking at being able to say to the court, well, why should I only have 10%? If we go back to restitutory principles, actually I should be on 10%, not eight. Particularly in a run long running case, you might be able to persuade the court that you ought to be awarded a much higher sum the next uh, heading that I've noted is the subrogation complication. Generally speaking, you're not asking the court to uh, borrow uh, a term from the Wizard of Oz, look behind the curtain. I wonder if um, you're in an insured position where you're a pursuer, but actually in real terms, you had um, your losses made good by an insurer a significant amount of time ago, but nonetheless, you're turning up to argue that you ought to, um, in real terms, be compensated to a much higher level because you would have had a, a significant investment return if you'd had the money. Well, you did have the money. So does that cut your argument off? This is an area that I'm going to do more research into, and I'm happy to discuss it further with anyone uh, that is interested. Uh, the final point to note from a defender's perspective is, and this was highlighted in the Farstad case, the cost of borrowing. So in real terms, a commercial organization has options available to it that an average pursuer does not. They might be able to borrow the funds in order to make good any losses at an earlier date. If you can turn to the court from a defender's perspective and demonstrate that the cost of the borrowing, borrowing to put themselves back in the position would have been lower than the sum that they're suing for or they're seeking in terms of judicial interest, again, you have another avenue for exploration and uh, potentially undermining the pursuer's case. So my closing thoughts, I'm uh, happy, very happy actually to discuss uh, this further if anyone has any specific cases in mind. Um, closing with a, uh, a terrible pun, if people have found this talk to be of interest and want to do some further research, uh, the Scots Law Commission uh, did a paper uh, back in September of 2006. This was Lord Tyre. Uh, this is paper number 203. It's referenced in most, if not all, of the cases that I've highlighted today. The Scottish Government has not, as of yet, adopted any of the recommendations in that report. Uh, that report recommended that you pin judicial interest to the uh, Bank of England interest rate with uh, plus one percent um, on a rolling basis um, to keep interest in line with what the market is doing generally. I don't think that ultimately changes the content of today's talk because we're talking largely about historic cases. And frankly, what the market's doing now is largely irrelevant to what it was uh, doing previously. And uh, frankly, if the Scottish Government hasn't done anything with this paper since 2006, and I uh, briefly checked before the talk to see if there was anything on the books for it, and there isn't, they're probably not going to do anything with it now. That concludes my talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, oh, perfect. Right, let's have a look at And I think the follow up was um, with a big payment on personal injury that it might be argued that they would have bought the house. Frankly, yes, that is a perfect question. And my answer to that would be yes. Um, 
And on the basis that you can uh, have a, a, an individual pursuer that the court finds credible and reliable that says I would have bought a house and I would have bought a house in X area. And assuming that's accepted, I don't think it's controversial to say that actually in terms of the investment return, the investment return on the house is uh, a matter that can be calculated and ought to be uh, added in. Um, I do question whether you might be looking at this uh, to a certain extent in some areas as an additional head of loss, particularly more in the commercial sphere um, with your uh, pleadings in terms of an additional uplift to judicial interest being effectively an ESTO position to cover your back just in case the court isn't with you on that. Um, but I would say, and that was one of the, the things that I had in mind for this talk, um, generally speaking, as a matter of practicality, you hand somebody a large amount of money, I think that there is an argument that they probably would have bought the property with it. Exactly. So there's, I mean, to a certain extent, uh, yeah, and save the rent I've paid. I do think there is a risk in um, inviting the court to go too far down the rabbit hole, as it were. There will be a limit, I think, um, where a sensible judge will look at this and say, no, I, I'm going to stop here and not go into consequential losses. I think the cleaner you can make the argument in terms of judicial interest um, and the, the more simple you can make it, and again, that was featured in discussing and carefully managing your expert actuary, the more likely you are to be successful in persuading the court that they ought to go along with what you're saying. Potentially. Now, the reason I say potentially is that the Farstad case, um, you're welcome, William, sorry, I just said thanks. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the Farstad case is a bit of an outlier because that one literally just uses the Bank of England interest rates, whereas the rest of them are all very hesitant to commit to departing from sort of the established practice. Um, the difficulty that, that I think you have in terms of not taking the scientific approach is that Sheridan has kind of shut the door on that again by saying, look, we have 8%. It might be unfair sometimes because it's broad brush, it takes the middle of the road. Sometimes it might um, rob a, a pursuer, sometimes it might overcompensate them, but there's a, there's a certainty to it. And that, that certainty is worth, um, in the average cases, just sticking with what it is. I think you want the special circumstances argument. You want to say this has been really long running and I can demonstrate to you that 8% either substantially over uh, comp compensates the pursuer or undercompensates the pursuer. And that's your, your angle into it because you're not trying to change the judicial approach. You're just trying to demonstrate that yours is a special case. You're not looking to establish a precedent. This is just this particular individual needs different treatment because they have special circumstances. If that assists. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Well, given it's half past five, <laughs> <laughs> um, it might be twice. <laughs>Thank you very much, Thomas, and I'm not going to detain anybody. Indeed, already our numbers are probably dropping as people online are disappearing, and I will release the people in the room. Um, it seems to me these three talks have illustrated very much how um, practical assistance is so readily available from our cohort of um, about to calls. Um, new legislation, and then Actually, Thomas, you have brought yourself and Sarah together as a dream team, <laughs> mathematician, <laughs> expert evidence, and the arguments that are um, in line with um, <clears throat> the interest payments. Um, we are genuinely interested as a stable in feedback about the topics and about the format. So please do channel them back. Thank you to everybody on, I keep looking at the wrong place for the camera. Thank you to everybody on Zoom. Andrew, is there anything you wish particularly to say, but briefly? Yeah, only that when will we start?
<laughs> right. So for those in the room, they, they are being rewarded. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. And um, Andrew, you can perhaps discontinue the video conference.